Executive function is a set of mental skills that we humans use to plan, hold information in working memory, and generally get things done. Collectively, these are referred to as cognitive control, and they go a long way in explaining what makes humans unique in the animal kingdom. For example, no other animal can plan in the way we do, thinking decades ahead and making sacrifices now for that far off future. So how does executive function work? Today on the Thinking Tools podcast, I speak with Dr. David Better, a cognitive neuroscientist and the author of this 2020 book, On Task, How Our Brains Get Things Done, which is all about cognitive control. David Better is Professor of Cognitive Linguistic and Psychological Sciences at Brown University, where he is also on the faculty of the Kearney Institute for Brain Science. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan. He received his PhD from MIT and did postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley before joining Brown as faculty in 2008. His laboratory studies the neuroscience of cognitive control and executive function. I hope you enjoy this episode, this conversation. Let me know what you think in the comments. Also, if you get anything out of it, please consider liking this episode and subscribing on YouTube or giving the show a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you use. That is, if you think it deserves it. Now, without further ado, here is my conversation with David Better. Okay, looks like we're recording. All right, so here with... uh, David Better, that's the correct pr- pronunciation, right? Yeah, very good. Good, okay. Um, all right, so I'll have read your full bio before the actual conversation, but maybe in your words, uh, what, you know, um, how did you get involved in cognitive neuroscience and how did you come to this particular field of study? Um, so I, I was always interested in the brain. Um, And when I was in college, it was right around when um, cognitive neuroscience was starting to to uh, emerge as a field. And the main thing that drove it, and this isn't this this often happens in science, right? We're we're very much driven by our tools. Um, It was right around the advent of human neuroimaging. So at that time, it was the PET scanner was the was the thing. And this was it was it felt at the time like a real revolution because it was it was up until then if you were interested in, in studying the brain either you worked in animal models primarily or you did uh, human neuropsychology which was the study of um, for instance brain disorder or study of, of patients with brain damage and things like that it was very rare to be doing anything um, with uh, in the sort of healthy human brain but neuroimaging meant that you could actually kind of see what was happening while people were doing the task and 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 in a way that was non-invasive, means not harmful, right? And all of this. And so it was, you know, and, and it's, it, these days it's kind of hard to appreciate but there's a, you know, scanners everywhere. And we actually kind of sick of, of imaging results in the, in the press. But at that time, it felt like we just discovered the telescope. It was like, you know, it was, we were suddenly gonna solve it all. And I think there was a lot of excitement and that, that combined with just a general interest I had in, in the brain and cognition got me, you know, taking some courses uh, early on in college and looking into it. And I was lucky enough to start working in, in research Research and I um, found that I, I really enjoyed it. So very quickly got into it and and, uh, um, and started doing cognitive neuroscience for my career. In terms of why um, why cognitive control, I actually came out uh, to that through an interest in memory. I started actually as someone who studied memory um, and tried to under, uh, trying to understand you know how we retrieve what we retrieve. But that shifted me more and more to, to a focus on goals. Like how is it that we use information? How is it that we're able to take what we what we remember and not just remember it, but remember it when it's useful? And that really pushed me to asking questions more and more about. Um, how we structure tasks, how we think about goals and how that, how we can structure our own cognition to do things that we need to do. And that was a really interesting problem to me. And so through the course of my training through graduate school and postdoc and so forth, I increasingly moved into that, into that, that speciality. Yeah, that's, that's very cool. That's, um, and, and you've done a lot of work in that area of cognitive control. And, um, you know, that includes this, this book that we're going to be talking about a lot today um, on task. And I was wondering if you could kind of give uh, what your overall thesis is in that book. Well, the, the book is really is to um, give a in-depth introduction to the neuroscience of this topic, cognitive control. And so cognitive control, it's, it's um, the function. It's a, it's a function that refers to actually a bunch of different mechanisms that the brain has to take our goals, take our plans, 
uh, our intentions and translate them into actions. It sort of bridges this gap between knowledge and action. Um, and I think the main, one of the, the um, things about studying cognitive control that it might not be intuitive or might not be something that you realize is that, that there's a gap to be bridged there. Right? That it's not sufficient just to have a goal and really want to do something. The brain really requires, even if you can imagine yourself doing the thing, even if you know the instructions for the thing you're doing, I can tell you how to, you know, you, I want to make this sandwich. I have a recipe in front of me. I, I know I can imagine myself doing all of the things I need to do to make this sandwich, but I have to really sequence out a set of actions in the world. I have to monitor those actions. I have to adjust to what's happening in the environment. I have to overcome habitual and kind of automatic kinds of actions that I have in order to actually make that sandwich. And it turns out that's a really difficult problem um, for the brain to solve, but it's one that um, humans do remarkably well. We have a capacity of, of engaging in control that's um, not really, it's on a scale that's greater than any other species and, and, and a, no AI can currently match it. And so it's a really interesting problem scientifically and with a lot of importance for understanding the human condition. So that's what the book is about. So we cover it, it really it tries to give a broad introduction to that topic. Yeah, it, it really does. And I've, I've said this multiple places, but it's, it is my new favorite book about the brain. Um, I just feel like it's very clear account of, of um, your, your subject area. And uh, I really recommend it to people. Um, but in that area, I think I think most people will be more familiar with the term executive control or executive function. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in early on in the book, you say that you don't differentiate between those terms. So is cognitive control the same as executive function in your mind? Yeah. I mean, you can think of them almost as, as interchangeable. There's some differences in sense in the field and the way that they get used. Executive function often refers to um, uh, kind of a collection of executive skills things like inhibition or um, planning or what have you. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's really has a tradition in neuropsychology and in, in human development and so forth as a result of that. Um, but it's really talking about the same kinds of functions. Cognitive control is, is talking about the same thing, but it's really focused more at thinking of it in terms of a control system. So how is it that we can you know, set a particular goal and then make adjustments and make things in order to, to reach that goal really in a control theory sense. Um, but they really are, and, and it doesn't really require the same kind of collection of skills that, you know, it, through years of study, we really haven't found, you know, strong brain correlates of those individual executive kinds of functions per se. Um, though they exist, though, I mean, people can exhibit those kinds of functions and what they do. We don't find like there's a brain region for each of those, those things. And so um, as a description, I you know, I think a lot of Cognitive neuroscientists and cognitive scientists have shifted towards using the term cognitive control, and, and that's the reason. But yeah, the, the I think colloquially, executive function might be more familiar. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so before we kind of jump into uh, executive function, cognitive control, and the neuroscience of the and the prefrontal cortex and all that, um, I just want to ask a couple questions about kind of the the psychology of it and some things I think people might be interested in. Um, so how, if, if it is possible, I think you, you talk about this uh, near the end of the book, but um, how can we increase or improve executive function or cognitive control? Um, I guess uh, to, to maintain it when we start to get to older ages and um, start to experience some cognitive decline or even just kind of in our younger years, trying to improve those functions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's an open area of research, right? If there are really solid ways to improve your, your or uh, your reliable ways to improve cognitive control function. And in fact, there's been a lot of um, investment both in research as well as in the private sector in um, kind of brain games and, and uh, training tools to try to improve it. There, it. It doesn't seem that there's any one reliable I'll say this first, like what we can't do is there is in terms of training and those types of, of brain games, there hasn't been strong evidence for their efficacy for how well they work. For the most part, it doesn't seem like 
a sort of there's a really a, a get smart quick game that you can use to, in order to you know up your up your multitasking ability or to suddenly be able to plan better or something um because you were training with this with this piece of software and when people have done you know careful uh properly blinded or properly controlled um clinical trials of those kinds of procedures they've not found both in whether it's healthy people just trying to improve their function or older adults or groups with with um, uh, psychological or, or neurological um, problems that affect control th there really hasn't been one to show a consistent effect that that persists over the long term that being said i mean i guess another reason to to maybe you know, read a book like this or to, to study this thing is that we do by knowing something about the function there are maybe some things we can do to try to if not improve our control function at least help ourselves to help our control function to work better right for i mean one example is multitasking right so multitasking we, we don't multitask well and i think um and we may want to talk about that later more but um you know the best way to improve your multitasking is not to do a brain game it's just don't multitask Right, and find ways to, to avoid um, putting yourself in the position where you have cues to other tasks, even or the um, or you're 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 kind of put you you're you're drawn by um, cues that take you into other kinds of task states and things like that. And so, you know, the more we know about about control, there's lots of examples like that. Then there can be there can be things we can one can try to do to to improve our control function. But yeah, if there was a if there was a real if there was a, a pill that we could give you to improve cognitive control, it would have widespread effects because it you know it it's, gets gets indicated in a wide range of, um, of problems as you mentioned from aging to um, to a wide range of, of patient groups. Yeah, um, I guess one one thing you mention in the book is uh, kind of just doing tasks that require cognitive control and kind of learn, learning new skills is something that you highlight uh, as a way of kind of keeping ourselves sharp over time. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, you can. I mean, it's certainly the case that um, that use helps, right? And staying and staying active with things helps. You know, I think if you do, um, you know, having, say, a variety of tasks that you're working on, right, that with, with regularity and practicing those as you get older, that can be helpful, particularly if they're new things that you're, you're trying to learn, right, that can, that can be helpful, but yeah. Very cool. Cool. Um, all right, so this, this question, uh, it's just something I, I've kind of, I was thinking about while I was reading your book and then diving into some of the other literature in the, the cognitive control um, area. Uh, so do you consider emotional regulation a feature of cognitive control? I've, I've heard some, um, some authors, some scientists refer to it as hot cognitive control versus kind of the cold cognitive control that uh, might be more, more cognitive <laughs> in nature. Um, how do you think about emotion regulation uh, as far as cognitive control and executive function go? I think it definitely falls within the, the realm of, of, of cognitive control. And in fact, a feature of, I mean, often we learn a lot about things like cognitive control from patients that have, say, um, have lost, uh, have damaged the systems that affect cognitive control, things like that. And one of the features of um, uh, uh, disexecutive or frontal lobe syndrome, right, which is that that's one of the systems that gets impacted um, when, with cognitive control, is that you can have dysregulation of emotion, can be have a hard time controlling, have, have, can have bursts of rage or, or outbursts that are emotional, can also, and it can also go the other way too, it can have sort of a, a blunted affect relative to, um, to situations. Uh, and, and so it, it's, it's sort of inappropriate aff affective responses on both sides. Um, there's also lots of interesting work on how um, uh, people with uh, control deficits interact with and with frontal lobe deficits interact with others, right? There's a, you know, a lot of in, in the social domain, a lot of our affective uh, processing about ourselves as well as other people is done through, you know, interpreting other people's reactions to us and our own reactions to them. And that also tends to, to um, have, have problems with frontal lobe deficits and, and cognitive control deficits. So I would definitely put affective regulation and, and emotional regulation in the same bin. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. All right. Well, um, now I, I guess we're going to move a little bit into the, the neuroscience. Uh, you mentioned the frontal lobes and um, I guess a central player in cognitive control in the brain is the prefrontal cortex. 
Um, so can you talk a little bit about what makes the prefrontal cortex well suited to exerting cognitive control? And um, I also want to kind of look at the event. Well, this will be in a, in a little bit, but talk about the subregions and the, the networks that the prefrontal cortex is a part of. Um, but maybe just uh, thinking about what makes the PFC well suited to exerting cognitive control. And maybe you can talk about connections to other regions or the, the, uh, the organization of cells within that uh, region, that big region, and um, perhaps the cell types or however you want to tackle it, really. Those are some options. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a, um, so prefrontal cortex is, um, and which is the, like, sort of for people, for people, I don't know what people's anatomy background is, but the frontal lobe is, you know, as, as it's named the front lobe of the brain and the prefrontal cortex is the, the redundantly named front of that frontal part of the, of the, the, the cortex and that, and the prefrontal cortex has, has a long association with executive function and cognitive control. Um, there are, it is, it's well suited in a number of ways. One is it's it's a major hub of information um, from around the, from other other uh, both sensory and emotional and memory systems that can provide information that can be used for monitoring your behavior and for controlling what you're going to do. And so it's it's actually a it serves as it, it's a major um, association cortical area right in terms of receiving lots of information from all over the brain. Moreover, it, the, within the frontal lobe itself. Um, it has, particularly in the more anterior portions of the, of the frontal lobe, it has a, um, a lot of connections within the frontal lobe itself. So it's, it's sort of these, in which people have, have hypothesized for a number of years might help sort of its, its integrative processing and how, and how hierarchical it is in terms of um, the way it processes information and integrates information. But really in, in terms of its, its, um, its sort of being at the center of a, of a control network, it's 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 that it's both its inputs and its outputs are, are very hub-like in the sense of being being very connected to a lot of other areas. And, and as I should say, it's not just the prefrontal cortex, but that, but as you alluded to, the prefrontal cortex is part of an entire network, which includes the parietal lobes and other areas um, that uh, that serve a similar um, have a similar property to them. Yeah, yeah. And I want to jump back into that in just a second. Um, but there are subdivisions of the PFC, and um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about some of the different subregions in the prefrontal cortex and kind of what differentiates them in terms of their function. Sure, I mean that's a that that's been a um, a topic of scientific debate for a number of a number of years, like what the what and for even how to divide. You know, for different frontal subregions, do you divide, do you divide them based on site or architecture? Do you divide them based on their connectivity? Do you buy, divide them based on um, their laminar structure? That means like how cells are layered within the within the cortex. And so there's been a, there's been you know depending on how one tries to map these to function, right? There's been a lot of debate about what we should expect in terms of how fractionated uh, the the frontal lobes are. A lot of what's influenced my thinking have been functional studies, like either you know through Doing neuroimaging or through neuropsychological study or both, um, and there are, and I think the the, you know, I think we've moved away to some degree from thinking of the of the frontal lobe as breaking up into individual areas, as opposed to thinking of of both there being sort of organizing patterns within the within the frontal lobe itself, and that there are multiple networks that are represented that um, the frontal lobe is, is a member of, and really that's the way to kind of its functional. Organization. So I'll talk at that level because I think that's the one I'm most comfortable with. And so there are there you know there are different organizing principles, and I'll give you. And one of them is um, that as one moves from uh, networks that incorporate sort of regions in the back of the frontal lobe, what we would say we call it caudal or towards the back, relative to the ones that are more towards the front or rostral networks. There's a, there's a, an increasing association with, or there's some evidence that you have an association with more abstract kinds of of control, following rules that are further away and more distant from the overt motor response. In fact, it's sort of, it's, it, I mean, in terms of the actual distance, you're going from motor cortex, the part that's actually doing the motor 
function is sort of here. As you move forward, you're actually kind of, it's, a, it's, the, it's almost like the metaphor is you're moving away from that, that overt motor response. And there's been, um, you know, I think early on people thought that was a, a gradient or separate areas. And now we've seen that those, there are separable networks that, um, that are ranked in that way. And those networks uh, are, can represent information with, at sort of different levels of abstraction, at least from the motor to the more, to the more cognitive and then even to maybe higher order kinds of abstract plans and rules. Yeah, that's fascinating. That was that was something I I wanted to uh, talk about was that that um, <clears throat> caudal to rostral gradient that you were just talking about, um, and something you mentioned is the the output to input ratio of um, of the prefrontal neurons as you move down that gradient. If I'm not mistaken. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that is and how that relates to this kind of concrete to abstract gradient? Sure. Yeah. It's, so I guess we should back, maybe I should back up and, and, and quickly describe what we mean by uh, what the critical like functional concern here right, is. And that's that often we're, we're, um, we're, we're, when we're, we're thinking about the frontal lobe's involvement in a, in a task, it, it's, it's, for instance, it, you, we often think of it in terms of the jargon would be a policy, but we can think of it like a rule. Right, you have some condition. Right? I'm in some environment, and I want to take a particular action given the environment I'm in. So, an example I often give, and this is an important aspect of control. So, is that um, I'm going to get back to your question. I just feel like we need to set up a, a no. Little go go for it. Advance, yes. But, so, so an example I often give, right, is is with my kids, for instance. We teach them the indoor outdoor voice rule. I don't know if you know this rule, but um, you know it's when you're indoors, you're supposed to speak in a soft voice. When you're outdoors, you can yell and shout as much as as much as you like. All right, and so it's, that's a really important rule, right? In the sense you have to take a context. In this case, it's the context of indoor or outdoor, and you use that in order to to know in what way you should speak. So the same eliciting event, like you know, one of my one of my sons, his brother does something really exciting. He might have to have you know that eliciting input means he either gets to shout and go crazy if he's outside or inside he should try to um, uh, not do that and you can imagine that's really hard for him so so to, to do exactly that kind of contextual control right so that's but but you could you know that's an example of of a, of a context right determining a behavior but of course um, we can stack those contexts even more hierarchically, right? For example, we can make that context contextual rule contingent on, contingent on yet another context. For example, my older son has learned um, that the whole indoor outdoor rule con um, thing is itself of a class of rules that are relevant when I'm around, right? So I, I form an even another kind of superordinate context that tells him whether he needs to pay attention to the indoor outdoor context in order to determine how he's going to behave and so forth, you know, and, and so on. And so the brain has to be able to manage these kinds of complex uh, hierarchical relations, sometimes holding different contexts on the fly in order to contingently decide what other context to do in order to, to make a response. And, that, and you have to organize all that and rank it. And it's a hard problem to do, uh, to do all that. So it's in that context that this sort of we you know we've seen evidence of these kinds of rostral to caudal effects right as people as people have to deal with these with rules and we're not doing the indoor outdoor voice rule we're doing things in the laboratory but um, as you have to engage in more and more higher order contingencies we see invoke you know engagement of these higher order networks um, and so one uh, and so one idea then is that there's a hierarchical actual structure that that's a structure function relationship there's a hierarchical structure to the prefrontal cortex such that um, certain networks are going to, their activity is going to have a um, more influence on lower order networks than vice versa. You can kind of think of it like any, any think of a hierarchical system. I don't know, like a, the, the structure of the, like of an org chart of a, of a company, right? Like the CEO's decisions influence are inherited by everybody else, but you know whatever is happening by the middle manager is, is not inherited by the CEO. So there's an asymmetry right of influence. And so anatomists have both in the monkey as well as in humans um, have looked at the con connectivity within the, the, um, the prefrontal cortex for that kind of asymmetry. Where do you see a, you know, if you see essentially your ratio of output 
greater than your ratio of input, it's like you're the CEO, right? You're, you have more influence than you, than um, on the, you're broadcasting more than you're inputting and vice versa, right? If you're kind of lower order, you'd have a, you, you might, or if you're an input area, you might have the opposite. You're basically inputting much more than you're output. Okay, and so what you see is, as you go from sort of the, the caudal portions of prefrontal cortex, more rostrally up to a point, up to about the mid lateral um, prefrontal cortex is where sort of the peak of this, of the top of the hierarchy, so to speak. Um, there's the, you get this um, increasing um, output to input ratio, but then it flips, right? Actually, as you go to the most rostral, it becomes, and that appears to be more of an input region than an output region. Um, and we think it's because of, of, I think it's because of actually that's a, that's a, it connects with other kinds of inputs um, that aren't sensory, but are due to internal states and things like that. But so that's another potential regional distinction. And that's a current area of science, I should say. It's, that's really like, there's lots of debate about all of that right now. Um, but, but nonetheless, that's, that's one observation that's an anatomical observation, which seems to map onto the kinds of observations we see functionally, where when people are have to use more and more contexts over say different intervals, longer intervals of time or over at higher orders of contingency, like the indoor outdoor voice rule, right? That you see engagement of those more rostral networks and it sort of map, mirrors also the, what we see in that uh, and those anatomical in, influences as well. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Um, and uh, I remember you saying that if, um, if there's damage to more caudal regions, uh, people will have difficulty executing, um, let me get this right, uh, more shallow rule trees. Um, but if it's damaged further back, they have difficulty with deeper and shallow, or sorry, if it's more, more rostral, then uh, they have more difficulties with um, deeper and shallow rule trees. Is that correct? Is that one of the pieces of evidence for, for this idea? That's right. And there's at least two studies to show this, one we had done and one that was done by a group in, in France showing that if, if you have damage along that axis, um, that the more, the more caudal the damage sort of the, you, you're disrupted. It's that you can think of it again, because of that asymmetric flow, you're, you're damaging not just the simple rules, but also the higher order ones, because they can't leverage that. But, but the, you'll, as the more rostral, you start to lose sort of the higher order or more complex rules in that case. Right, right. Um... So, yeah, and I, uh, I don't want to lose sight of this idea of um, the role of the prefrontal cortex networks. Um, so I guess, what, what are the primary brain regions that the, the prefrontal cortex works with um, in exerting cognitive control? And why are those particular regions functionally important? So I'm thinking here of like the parietal lobe or the striatum. Um, and take that however you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start by saying, I think one of the most fundamental insights coming from human cognitive neuroscience in the last decade has been that the brain it can be sort of broken up into multiple of these networks when people are engaged in different tasks, right? That, that, into that you know, that the thousands of neurons in one part of the brain, like the frontal lobe, are gonna consistently be networking with a pool of neurons in other lobes, in the parietal lobe or elsewhere, right? And these sort of broad net, um, networks, kind of macro scale networks. And I think that's something we had to have things like fMRI that can look at, the, have to take this whole brain view. And it's, I mean, and it's sort of an advantage of being a thousand feet away from the, from what's happening, right? Is that you get that, that, that bird's eye view of the brain to see that kind of co-variation. And it's, it's not contiguous, right? It's not like all the neurons in this strip are all, are all the areas in this whole area are, are, are correlating with each other. Rather, it's like this pool, you know, up here in the frontal lobe, and then there's a pool in the parietal, as you mentioned, that's going to co-vary with it. And it seems to ha happen across, you know, even when people are at rest or when they're engaged in different kinds of tasks. And so the first thing, the first thing I'll say is this is cognitive control is sort of no different than a wide range than of other functions now in the sense that it seems like they, they rely on the, this large scale network processing um, uh, for, for its, for its function. So, um, and that means it's, it's, so you'll, and it'll often you'll have, it'll have a, you know, neurons in multiple lobes of the brain, parietal or in, in temporal, as well as medial, um, areas as well, and, uh, towards the middle of the brain. So it's, that's just the first, the first thing to say is that this is, you know, not characteristic. Why, you know, why parietal and why temporal is not fully clear. 
honestly. It's there's a lot of there are a lot of hype, like what is it that like why these particular um networks right or is it something about their position and there's a lot of hypotheses about this that are being tested like one of the most interesting lines of work out there right now is that um is that people are reconceptualizing the control problem in terms of how we transition from one brain state to another brain state right so you can think of it as you know if you want to translate from the functional level that we were talking about where you've got a goal and you want to take a particular action or you think of that as being being i need to in the brain i have to go from one state Right to an end to a to a desired state that corresponds to that particular goal, whatever it is, and action so forth. Okay, and so you need that becomes a, a classical control system problem, right? Where I need to know how, what what would I need, like how much energy or how much do I need to do to input to this configuration to a particular brain state? If I can define like the activity around my head, around my brain, as being one state, how do I get to another state? Right, any other state I want to get to, right? And the more I can do that, that I can determine that. If I can determine my way to any other state, that's a very controllable system, right? From an engineer, from a, from what's from an engineering controllability perspective. And so people have tried to study, like have done things like like Danny Bassett um, at UPenn has done this and others by looking at the at the structural connectivity of the brain, the connectome of the brain. Asked, you know, what are the are there networks that are really important for those transitions? Like if I'm going from any particular in start state to an end state, right? Are there important, like are there sort of hub-like area or networks or that seem to make that more efficient? And so to some degree, you know, some, there's been there's been a wide range of findings on this, but those those frontal parietal networks engaged in control seem to be important for those, they seem to be positioned, and it kind of comes back to your first question well for that kind of controllability particularly for getting into states that are uncommon like for for you know states you don't usually get into those are um, um it's in those those networks tend to be important um and so maybe that starts to get us to an, an answer for why those particular um why we're positioned they're positioned in that way around the brain perhaps if, it's, if, if you think about it that way yeah absolutely and um well uh and that that definitely makes sense on on that level um and i was i was also thinking of just the role of like the striatum and the, the globus pallidus kind of that that whole cluster of areas um mm -hmm. and uh i mean i know that there's a lot there but i was wondering if if you could talk a little bit about how these these regions that are involved in in movement and reward and and those kinds of things why are they important for various aspects of cognitive control. And sorry if that's too general of a question, I can get a little more specific. Yeah, that's no, that's fantastic. I, mean, I, I do think that gets at, the, at least the way I, I now think about the mechanisms of control, my current thought about it, um, is, it's, is it's, that's just essential to, the, um, to control function. So uh, backing up again, I mean, one of the, the key to, again, to more of a psychological level, one of the key things you need for control is a working memory. Right. You need a way of holding, again, if I go to the example of my, my, my kids, right, they need a way of holding that context indoor, outdoor, in mind, right, potential, you know, to, in order to act as a signal right, within, within the brain to foreground that information so that the brain can use it to make it make its response. Um, the, um, so as a result, and, and that's the case for almost any, even the very, very simple control problem that you want to do. If you're in your car and your phone buzzes and you want to you want to not answer it because you shouldn't be you shouldn't be texting while driving again you want to be holding in your head some rule or if, uh, these days if you want to if you want to leave the house and, and thankfully now we just we're just getting rid of our masking rule but up until now I always had to remember to bring a mask with me it's not was not my usual behavior I could easily wander out the, the door without it I have to remember in the context right now of a, of a pandemic so I need to I need to you know follow those rules and so I hold that in my working memory and it governs my behavior. So from these examples, maybe it's, it should be clear that it's really important that what, how we manage working memory, how we decide what information gets in the memory, and we also decide when, when we allow that information to um, act as a guiding control signal for our behavior. And, and a lot of our, our mistakes and our slips of action, when we, when, we, when we make errors and what we're doing are often because of a failure at one of those levels. We forgot, we missed the, 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 the uh, information, either putting the information in memory or we missed the right moment to allow it to act as a, as a control signal. Um, and I can say more about that 
uh, if you like. But nonetheless, that's so we call that problem a gating problem because the idea of the metaphor is that you have it's like a gate on memory, right? When that gate is opened, information can get into working memory or it can come out. And when the gate's closed, it keeps irrelevant information out of memory and it keeps that information in memory from acting as a control signal prematurely or at the wrong moment. So the um, and so the gate control is really important. You have to like the right moment or the right where you're you're most likely to have good outcomes when you gate that information. So this is where the basal ganglia mechanism is is really crucial because the bit we've we've known for a long time um, that the basal ganglia plays an important role in motor control, and the control and the the role it plays there is very much like a gate where you have um, the the classical model is that if I want to make a movement. Um, the, the action I want to take gets um, represented by neurons in an area of the, the caudal frontal lobe called the premotor cortex. Kind of, you think of like the motor plan. But, um, and that movement isn't executed. There's not enough drive for that movement under normal circumstances because the, um, the, there are dynamics between the premotor cortex and the thalamus that are needed for that drive. And it's that those dynamics are inhibited. The thalamus is under inhibition by the basal ganglia, by the structure called the globus pallidus, tonically. So, um, but that same motor plan, like a carbon copy, gets sent to another area within the basal ganglia called the uh, putamen, where there is, um, where it can weigh um, sort of the, the value of that. that. That part of the brain gets not just the information about the plan, but it also has information from other parts of the brain about the context you're in. Um, and even and it, and it, through uh, mechanisms of learning has learned about the value of that action given that information. If it's, if it, and so it has a disinhibitory, that um, brain structure has a disinhibitory influence on the global on the, or inhibit, actually it inhibits the globus pallidus, which disinhibits its inhibitory connection to the thalamus. And the result is if you have, if it thinks that's a useful action, you're gonna go. It's gonna be able to disinhibit the, that, that inhibition and that allows you to make that action. That particular loop is essentially a positive feedback loop, right? It's a control system. And also there's, a, there's another path, the same pathway called the, the no-go pathway through that same structure, which would make it harder to do the movement if it wasn't a good movement to do. And so it allowed, that's, which is a negative feedback loop. So you have feedback control of a servo, a biological servo built into the, into the brain for motor control. So the idea that uh, I describe in the book and that I think has, has been a very influential, um, uh, and this is something that Randy O'Reilly at Colorado actually, and, and Michael Frank, uh, Randy's now at UC Davis, but he, he, he did this when he was still in Colorado, um, uh, had proposed in a you know, theoretical model. And, and there's been now evidence for it from both from their groups, as well as uh, we've done things in my lab as well, have suggested that um, that same mechanism may also then not just gate a motor action, but could gate a context out of working memory. So it could also the same neural computation, that same feedback circuit, um, not the exact same physical one, but the same computation can be used to um, decide when uh, information being held in working memory, for example, should be allowed to act as a control signal, should be amplified as a control signal, as well as also regulating its, uh, its input to that. To, to working memory as well. And you can do both of those mechanisms through, the, through that loop. It's a different physical loop, but it's still through the basal ganglia, but it's through the caudate. Um, and, it, and, it, and, and now instead of going with premotor cortex, you're talking about it interacting or with uh, the prefrontal cortex, but then those loops together can uh, allow you to, to gate actions, and gate memories effectively. And so, and, and that's a, a, a basic mechanism for doing cognitive control at a really fundamental level. Yeah. Yeah, that it's it's so interesting to to get into that. And um, one of the the things you talk about on with with a similar loop, or I guess it's sort of the reverse of one of those that you just talked about, but um, is stopping is our, our ability to stop a behavior. Um, you know, like if you're driving out into the street and you're about to hit something and you stop, and you're able to actually stop yourself. Um, that relies on these specific circuits, uh, the um, the subthalamic nucleus, if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, I was wondering if we could we could kind of walk through that mechanism a little bit and uh, feel free to to make analogies or or uh, generalize, but um, however you want to tackle that. Yeah. So what? So I should say there. I mean, there's a way to kind of. I, I mentioned there's this no go loop through the through the, the the gating circuit I just mentioned, right? And that one is can stop us. That might be able to make a, a specific movement less likely to be executed. But often we need to do a, a fast stop, like you just described. We really want to just stop in, in a particular action. Um, and that kind of, of speeded stopping, um, there's, I think there's some, there's excellent evidence that has its own pathway, which is distinct from the one I just described. It still goes to the basal ganglia, but it goes through the, the, um, the, the subthalamic nucleus kind of bypasses all of the, the deliberation happening in the striatum. And it does this very fast stop. And it also is very global. So unlike the, the gating mechanisms that were are selective that are picking this particular movement, that particular memory, this is sort of a general stop, stopping the whole, the whole system. But it's very fast. So it's speed, it's sort of trading speed for, for general generalizability in our ability in, in its stopping. And um, there's a, a work from um, a number of groups, but um, Adam Aaron and Trevor Robbins and others have implicated um, the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex specifically along with the STN as, a, as the network that's um, uh, as important components in this network and then as well as regions of the medial frontal cortex for that kind of for that kind of stopping. Um, and even in, and I've identified as a, you know has a particular uh, uh, sort of there's a there's a way there's a frequency of oscillation or a wave band uh, called called beta which seems to be related to this as well. This kind of stopping. Yeah, and uh, just to touch a little bit on the the global, you mentioned it's a global stopping, and I thought mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that you talk about was if uh, you know if somebody's trying to stop any kind of movement, if it, whether it's a hand movement or foot or an eye, um, you can kind of measure the response from the the premotor the motor. Well, I can't remember, but the premotor cortex or the motor cortex. Um, and show that it's uh, less responsive overall, not just in that one particular area corresponding to the body part that the person's trying to stop. Yeah, yeah, these are really, I think, very elegant experiments. So the, the, what the thing that the phenomenon they're using is they're using, a, they're using first a, a method um, called TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. And um, in TMS, it's, it's a, people don't know, it's sort of, it takes advantage of, um, uh, an electro, well, well, okay. So, so I'll be more concrete. So you have, you have like a wand, right. That's got, has these coils in it. It looks like a figure if the figure eight one is the most common one. It's kind of like an eight on a stick. And, um, when you pulse, uh, uh, elect, uh, you know, a volt voltage through that, that circuit, it'll produce a, um, uh, a magnetic field. And it, that magnetic field will produce a current in a conductive body nearby, if that magnetic field passes through uh, your scalp and your hair and your, your skull. And so the, the conductive area that it's targeting is your brain. So it's essentially puts, it's like, it's like eliciting a little bit of, of activity into the brain in a, in a safe and non-invasive way. Without, you know, it, it's really, if you put it over your motor cortex, if I pulse it over motor cortex, and I say I put it over the, the hand area of your motor cortex, then I pulse it, your hand's gonna move like that. Okay, um, it's like it's like it's like when you're when the if the doctor like hits your hits your knee with the with a mallet right that physically stimulates the neuron to cause you to do it to you to have a kick reflex the same basic thing except this is with electrical stimulation it causes the the brain to to be stimulated in that in that little focal spot so what they did in these experiments was um, showed that what you can you can you can measure I can measure in the, in the muscle. Right, using um, an EMG recording, I can measure when I pulse, right, how much of an elicited motor response I get or muscle response I get, right, from that, from that pulse. And it turns out the amount of excitability in a particular area can be, will affect that, right, the baseline excitability. So if it's the case that like I'm, um, you know, I am going to, if I'm, if I have you, it, even if I have you, let's say, imagine moving, moving this finger and I pulse, I can get a larger EMG out of that moment because of that excitability. So they, so what they did is they showed that if I have you stop your hand, 
okay? But I pulse your foot area and I measure your foot muscle, or I have you stop your foot and I measure your hand, right? That I get less excitability because you stop the other body part. So that means it's not, in other words, the, the stop, top, tamp down excitability across the motor, all motor effectors, not just the, the, the one you were stopping. So like you just have to stop your hand, right? In this experiment. Oh, and the way they do these experiments are, they, they, you, um, you, they're called stop signal tasks. So you, you're, you have a, a, all trials, you have a, what's called a go signal. So it'll be like an arrow to the left or an arrow to the right. If it's the hand response, then, you know, my left hand, if it's left, right hand, if it's right or whatever. And, you, and you're really trained to go as quickly as you can, left, right. But then every now and then, unpredictably, there'll be a tone, for example, before I respond. And if that tone happens, I need to stop my response. So you get the arrow says left, I start executing my response and then the tone comes and I, and I stop myself. I pull myself back from making that response. And that's exactly the example of that kind of countermanding stopping inhibition that you want, you stop that response. So you have someone do that with their hand at that point, you can show that excitability of the foot went down, even though you didn't stop your feet, you to stop your foot in this go task, right? And so that's the, that's what those, and so it, it, it's evidence then of this being a global uh, stopping signal, right? It's just sort of a general purpose. Like I need to go quickly. So just stop everything. Yeah. And what is the relationship with the emotion of surprise? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It seems, it, it does seem like the, a very similar circuit, the STN, again, the subthalamic nucleus seems crucial for this kind of stopping. And it's the same, um, and the STN again is involved if you have a, if you have a surprise. So let's say you're kind of a, a deer jumps out and you, you know, you're driving and for a moment you like, you, you're, you, you get shocked, right? And you, everything free stops. That is that, it's using that same kind of global circuit, um, the kind of surprise. Yeah. Wow. That, that, that is so cool. Um, all right. Well, I want to move on a little bit to questions about motivation um, because there's a chapter in your book where you cover motivation. And um, first, I just wanted to kind of uh, get people thinking and maybe you can answer this. I, mean, I know you can answer this question, but um why, why is motivation considered an aspect of cognitive control? Or is that a good way to think of it? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a great way. That's a great way to think of it. It's almost kind of why, why was it not considered part of cognitive? For, you know, for the longest time, we studied cognitive control without really much respect of motiv to, to motivation at all, right? We just, people just did, you know, we asked them to do, do some task and they do it. It's not really, there wasn't a consideration of, you know, of motivation being a part of it. But really we do things because we want to do them, right? We're motivated, we're cognitively, at the heart of cognitive control is that we have a goal, we have some plan, we have some task we want, we, that we want to do, um, or we have to do, um, and because we desire the outcome of that task. Um, and then we have to plan our way to do it. And I think one of the things that um, in recent years, people like, uh, Roshan Kools and Amitai Shinhev and Todd Braver and others have pointed at by, by pointing us at, at how value and motivation is, 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 is central to control. It's not, it's, it's really at this, that um, a lot of the time when we um, are, when we're engaging in planning or, or engaging in control, the, the outcome of our performance, how we, how we do on a task like that is as much determined by how effective we are at doing it, right? As it is how much we wanted to do it, right? Our motivation for actually doing that task. And, and even at the level of say patients that show um, problems with cognitive control, right? That, that it um, hasn't been well distinguished whether the problems they exhibit in their behavior, is it due to a problem with control? They aren't, they can't do the, they can't control themselves or is it that it's that motivational issue? They can't, they're not, they're balanced on their, on the outcome relative to, um, their, their motivation to engage in control is what's disrupted. And so those are things that are, um, I think this, this study of motivation and control has, has taught us that really you can't understand control without consideration of motivation um, and, and, it's, and the value of engaging in control. Yeah, and, and to mention some of those conditions, um, can you describe some of the differences and, and I guess just what they are uh, between a kinetic mutism, uh, abulia, and apathy, and because these are thought of as disorders of motivation, 
and uh, yeah, just take take that and run with it, I guess. Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'll say that there are. I mean, I'll tell you what kind of what these sorts of things are. So that things like akinetic mutism are um, examples of this. Of, akinetic mutism is is it it can come across like a form of catatonia in the sense you're not you know, there's not a lot of movement. It's not it's, it's not a lot of uh, you know, if someone, someone who has akinetic mutism may not move very, very much, they may not respond in a very um, strong way to stimuli or um, in the way that, that a healthy person would, but it's not because they can't move, right? It's they don't, they're not motivated to move, right? And so, um, and that's a, and it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting distinction, right? Because it, it kind of gets at the heart of this, right? That often we see performance deficits that aren't due to competency per se, but they're due to this sort of motivational. Um, and how, sorry to cut you off there, but how do, how do we know um, that it's not a movement disorder? What kinds of things might uh, a doctor or a scientist do to show this is not movement, but actually motivation? That's a great question. There can be lots of ways to do it. One is just by showing that with the right motivational, um, uh, say, Fact manipulation that that the performances can be can be normalized, right? That it's so it's in other words they can move. It's just that you have to find you have to motivation you know motivate them to do so or find other things ways to do it. I mean, if it was something that they couldn't move at all, like the example I often give is you know um, this comes up a lot in the notion of mental of mental effort and f mental fatigue, right? That um, you know the uh, um, is it the case that we can actually get is there a good analogy to physical of, of mental fatigue to say physical fatigue and, and then really that analogy breaks down in many ways and one of the biggest ways it does is with a muscle you can fatigue that muscle to the point that you can't lift a weight even a, a light weight if I if I were to sit here and, and and lift a weight repeatedly right until I fatigue my muscle no matter how much I want to I'm not going to be able to lift that weight again even if like it can give me like a two pound weight at that point and I can't I will not do it until I until I've rested the muscle and and I've and allowed the um, the the balance to reset in the muscle, so that I can I can lift again. I cannot move it no matter how much I want to. Conversely, with there's no evidence that that ever happens with mental activity. Right, for the most part, you're able to. Um, if I you know I, I, if you can do more math problems, you don't want to do another math problem, right? And at some point, and that's why you stop doing math problems. But if you can, you can do them for a very 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 long time, as long as you're eating and sleeping and so forth, without showing the same kind of breakdown and fatigue. Um, and so, um, it's a that's sort of the distinction I think we are. You know, it's, it's hard to show very often or find evidence of that level of fatigue and, and mental activity. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, when I first read that part of the book, I was like, okay, yeah, no, I think you can break down uh, doing um, any kind of mental exercise, but then you talk about these uh, experiments and one in particular by, I think uh, it was a Japanese woman, I can't remember her name, but um, just a grueling experiment. Maybe you can describe that a little bit. Yeah, so she, she did, this was in the, in the early 1900s. So it was like, a, you know, the experimental setup it was is quaint by, by modern standards, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great demonstration. So, and she was her own subject. Um, and so basically what, they, what she did was she would memorize these um, four digit multiplication. Right? She taught herself to like um, grab these numbers sort of out of a hat. She had a randomizing procedure. So four, two four digit numbers, close her eyes and do the multiplication in her head as fast as she could and write it down. And so she trained herself so she was really good at doing that. And then she went for, I forgot it was three or four days straight um, where she just from the morning until night with only a couple breaks to eat, um, just did four, di four digit multiplication problems over and over and over and over again, writing down her answers and recording how she felt about it. And just, and, and she, and she never was not able to, she described, I mean, the feelings of, of her, her loss of motivation or to the point where she was like, I want to throw up. I feel like I'm going to die. I don't want to do this anymore. But nonetheless, she, she, she didn't see it. She didn't get a trail off in her ability to actually do multiplication problems. And so, um, yeah, you know, and if, so if there is that limit, I mean, you know, this, it seems like it's pretty big capacity, right? Enough that it doesn't, we wouldn't worry about doing a, doing a, a, any normal mental activity, right? So clearly, that, but that's not to say that there it isn't an important cost to mental effort, 
right? So what she, what her, this experiment is, so it's, if, even if it's not the fact that we're fatiguing and these ideas about like a central resource of willpower that were, were popular while well, there's not really good evidence of that at all, um, including the seminal experiments that were thought to demonstrate it have not replicated, um, that um, what does is certainly the case, however, is that there's a motivational problem, is that if we, we don't, with hard problems, Right, that are taxing come with an experience of mental effort, which is aversive. And we, and, we, and we will discount outcomes from those tasks in accord with that mental effort, right? And so it's, if, and if so, if you want, I guess the moral of that story is if you want people to do mental work for you, you need to compensate them accordingly, right? Because they're gonna discount the outcome of that, right? Based on the amount of mental effort involved. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. Um, you know, so if the 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 mental or if the if the motive, if you've got the motivation, then you should be able to do whatever it is, assuming you're already cognitively capable of that thing. That's so interesting. Um, so I guess uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the, the neuroscience of motivation and just some of the brain structures, some of the key brain areas that are involved in motivation. Sure. I mean, one of the, I think, central structures from a cognitive control perspective, and there's a lot within motivation, right? There are systems for doing valuation um, and, and so forth. But I think one of the central structures uh, is, um, is the anterior cingulate. And people have, um, you know, both in animals and in humans have associated with motivational aspects of control. It's, the, it's classic association actually was with akinetic mutism, right? Some of the earliest patients showing damage or... or uh, uh, indications with that part of the brain. And, and just for, again, for the anatomy, this is this part of the brain, it's in the frontal lobe, it's in the medial surface of the frontal lobe. Um, uh, it's called in the uh, anterior, which means the front part of that, and, it's in, and dorsal, which means the opposite, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Um, and so that part of the brain has been associated with motivation and um, uh, for a long time. There, and, and there's interesting data too from, I think one of the most interesting studies, I described this one in the book, um, even from this, there was a study where they did stimulation in human neurosurgery patients that are they're having surgery for other reasons. And while they're undergoing surgery, they do electrical stimulation within the anterior cingulate. And those patients described sort of these this um, experience of sort of a drive, right? like there, there was like a hill they had to get over, a storm they had to get through kind of feeling, right? That, so there's a, there's a sense there was something motivational about it. And so these kind of clues, I think, have meant to scientists for a long time. This, this must be important in this aspect of, um, of motivation. I think, you know, as we try to get more mechanistic in our theorizing over the years, one of the, one of the interesting proposals has been the expected value of control theory that the anterior cingulate is, um, actually from my colleague here at Brown, uh, Amitai Shinhev, among others, is that there's a sort of an, the anterior cingulate is, um, has access to the, not just the outcome, the motivational salience, right? Like why, why do I want to do this, right? What's the, the benefit of the outcome, but also the, um, what's the, what, how much mental effort am I going to have to exert to achieve that outcome? Right. And then, and then you do a cost benefit analysis, right? Is it worth it? Right. If I want you to do this whole math book of, you know, elementary school, multiplication problems for one dollar, you're going to decide if that, you know, that's, is that, is, the answer your single has a sense, access to both how much control is needed to do that versus, you know, the outcome and it can kind of, and it's going to, and so it's motivational signal, the amount that's going to, it's going to basically amp up control systems is dependent on the kind of the outcome of that, of that trade-off. And, and then there, but there's been debate about that. I described some of that, and this is really an area, another, really a frontier of of neuroscience right now is trying to understand um, its exact role. And there are other ideas as well about what that part of the brain does, but that's a, that's a crucial one. Yeah. And I think uh, most often when people think about motivation, if they're at all familiar with like neuroscience, they probably think of dopamine. Um, how does, how does dopamine and the reward system play into that, the ACC and motivation generally? Well, it certainly plays a role in the um, in, in ACC, but as well as also in um, in the gating system that we mentioned earlier. That's actually where I, I think of it as having a strong effect on cognitive control. Um, so, just backing up real quickly. So, so one you know important aspect of dopamine is it seems to be not so much related to reward as opposed to reward prediction, 
right? And so, um, you know, nice, very, very elegant uh, experiments in animals have shown that the, you know, parts of the brain that are the sources of dopamine signals, uh, if you give an animal, say, a, a stimulus that predicts a later reward, when, they, when they're still learning it, when that, you know, the reward, it's like a squirt of juice comes up, right? When they get that squirt of juice, you get, you know, the dopamine neurons will fire like crazy. And so that's what, that's sort of was the, maybe the observation that we first made that maybe people think, oh, it's the, it's the, re it's the reward chemical. However, um, what's interesting, if you run those experiments enough, what you find is over time that that squirt of juice no longer elicits that firing. Rather, it's the, it's, it's, if you have a, say, a, let's say a particular light or a sound cues that upcoming um, juice squirt, that's the thing that drives those, the, the dopamine neurons will fire like crazy to that, to that predictive stimulus, and then not the, uh, when, the, when the actual um, juice arrives. However, if you give less juice than was expected, let's say you put your light and the juice doesn't appear, now the dopamine neurons actually, their firing rate goes down below baseline, Right, because it was worse than expected. If you gave them more juice than you would usually get from that light, you, it, then it'll go back up again. And so, what it feels, what it, what the the way you interpret that, and there was a, uh, a seminal paper from Reed Montague and Peter Diane, uh, along with Wolfram Schultz and others, that um, that uh, made the argument that that this is really computing it what's called a dopamine prediction error. So, dopamine signal is not the reward; it's the it's the um, error, the difference from what you predicted to right now. Okay. And so, and so that means even in the future. So that's, that, that square is predictive of, of reward down the road or that light or that sound. And so that's why you get a dopamine response at that point. And if nothing was predicting that, that's a surprising and good event. It's like, Hey, I've got some juice coming. Right. But then the juice itself comes, that's exactly what you expected. The difference, the prediction error is zero. So you get dope, no dopamine fire. Okay, so prediction error is important. And, um, and that's an important input to a, a number of areas in the prefrontal cortex, but also into the basal ganglia. And within the basal ganglia, dopamine has, this, has the effect of that gating system that we just mentioned. There's actually two effect, important aspects of what dopamine does. One is it drives the, the gate to be more likely to go, right? To more likely to disinhibit that, whatever it is. And that's a good thing, right? That means that if you encounter something that you, that's maybe predictive of a future future positive outcome based on what you've learned in the past, right? You're more likely to hold that thing in working memory, right? Because why you've got your, or, or to output it, if it's, if it's, if it's the condition that it's, it's a good thing to output it. And so you can, so that's going to drive it. Conversely, a reduction in dopamine is going to make it harder to do that. And so in cases of conditions like Parkinson's disease, for example, that show problems with cognitive control, often it's because of that dopamine reduction, right? It makes it hard, gives them a no-go bias. Um, the other thing that, that dopamine will do is it'll act as a learning signal. So you, so you'll, it'll change the, the way, you know, you may have be wondering up to this point from the descriptions I've been giving is how does the striatum know, like, this is the, this is the action to take given this, in this context, or how does it know this is the thing to put into working memory? Well, one answer to that is that is through learning. And so what those dopamine prediction errors can do is that if something happened that was good, after a particular thing was put in working memory or a particular action was taken, it can strengthen the synapses or um, that, dop that dopamine burst that happens because of that unexpected good outcome will, will make those synapses stronger. So the next time it's more likely to go again when that, and under that same condition. And over time, it'll incrementally kind of wire up the right thing. Conversely, a dopamine dip will make it less likely to go next time. And so, the, um, and so those will, that allows it to train the system to do things that are predictive of good outcomes that are motivated in the right, um, that, that are, uh, you know, meet our motivational goals, basically. And so that, that is sort of the, the origin of, of habits and addictions and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. If it goes, if that system goes awry, that can be a source of that. Yeah. A source of, a source of, uh, uh, of habits and addiction as well. Yeah. And I, I just remembered that as you were talking about the reward prediction error, um, there's a, a similar prediction error signal going on in the ACC. Is that right? Or am I? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So there's a, so there, but there it's not, it's not value driven. 
So the one that I just mentioned is value-based, like it's like a positive thing more than you expected or a negative thing less than you expected. But there's just any prediction error. And this is, I, this is a theory from Josh Brown and, um, and others. And, it's, and I described this in the book about anterior singular. That its activity can be described as sort of anything that differs from what you, whether it's good or bad, it's, without, it's just, this is something different than was expect, uh, expected, whether it's the response you made or the outcome or anything that happened at that point in time. So ACC is monitoring effectively the, the mismatch between the outcomes and the expectations uh, in that model. And that's another idea about what its, its role is in this, um, in, in this system. That's very, all very cool. Um... Well, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, evolution. You, you talk a little bit about kind of um, perhaps why cognitive control evolved over the, over the millions of years. And um, I, not that you have to recapitulate that whole argument, but uh, if you could just give a, a sketch of that idea, that'd be awesome. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this is this, of course, is is hard, right? This, the, it's the, this for me. It's as a as a laboratory scientist, it's very hard to think about what were good evidence in this in this domain. And I think you always want to try to accomplish something that's at all falsifiable. If you're doing like in any any scientific theory, and that that holds a lot for for evolution as well. But I but it's that time it's a really important question because if we want to understand a function, we want to ask sort of what's it, what's its What's its goal at a, at a you know in terms of the the fitness of the of the animal, um, and so there are a couple of things to say about this. I guess one is is I, I think is a question of what is it that cognitive control is doing functionally? What is it that it, it does, right? And I think one of the key aspects that control um, offers us is this is generative behavior and flexible behavior, the ability to um, do tasks we've never done before based on an abstract concept of what that is. And we have to, there has to be a way to do that. And that's because the way we, that means we have to be able to structure our tasks in ways that are compositional. That means we can break them down into, into pieces and then we can reassemble those pieces into new tasks as we need to. And that we need a way of doing that, um, being, being able to generalize that, right? So then you be able to specify something where we can, re, we can um, reassemble it. And, um, that, that, and that's something that, for instance, I think is unique about human cognition. And one of the best examples of that is the recent COVID experience. I have this slide now and I'm giving, I give kind of public lectures on control now where I, I show there's like the, um, there's this great, uh, um, uh, the, the data like science, data science hub, I think is the name of it, it has this, this thing where it shows over time the adoption of COVID mitigation behaviors, things like wearing masks and distancing and um, you know, even lockdowns and, and what have you. And it shows that over the year from, you know, from, from January, 2020 through the end of, of 2020. What you see is in March, there's just like worldwide this huge just adoption of everything different. Like everyone's shopping differently, they're talking differently, they're socializing. And these are things that none of us, had, most of us had never done before. I'd never worn masks everywhere. I'd never been actually done most of my work over Zoom. I certainly hadn't, you know, gone grocery shopping six to six feet away from everybody in one line. Like th there were just all new tasks and all at once. And, but, but, and so it was certainly not something my ancestors had ever done. And it's not something that, so it didn't take, you know, millions of years of evolution to, to, to acquire those behaviors. And it didn't take, you know, I try to get a, a uh, a monkey or a rat to do that it would take lots and lots of, of trials of reinforcement to ever get there. Humans, it's just like, I heard this on the news or whatever. I was told this by my employer. I was whatever. And I just do it. Right. And I can implement that. And so the fact that as a species, we can do that worldwide, make a, that radical a change is because we have this function of cognitive control. We can take, we can restructure tasks in, in, on the fly and we can and, and do them immediately. So that's one thing we need. And but the second component that I think is important is our ability to engage in episodic future thought. That we can we can also conceive of futures that we've never experienced before. We can we can understand you know through language as well, right? We can understand what um, what we need to do and can imagine these tasks, and then we can structure it here. So those two things together are 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 the critical 
um, function. So I go through in that chapter, I discuss a lot of the like the, the evolution, both of the of the biology, but as well as the sort of at the functional level, what um, you know, how they might have an, you know, the evidence for both of these things, evidence for compositionality of human behavior, evidence for our, our unique ability in terms of episodic future thought, and then how that might how that and then changes in the sort of generativity of human behavior over time, um, and how those two things might interact with one another. So that's kind of a general overview. Yeah, yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because, um, I mean, clearly, as you mentioned, we are unique or largely unique in this ability to uh, do things we've we've never done before under new contexts and rules. And uh, as you you alluded to, um, there's this idea that episodic future thought may be a human only ability. Uh, so. I guess that that strikes, I think, a lot of people as counterintuitive. Um, what what is kind of the evidence for that, or or do you think that's the the best way of of looking at why this is unique to humans, or um, yeah, how do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good point. I, you know, I always think it's really it's really dangerous to ever say that like there's a function that only humans have. Like I wouldn't say that only humans have cognitive control, and it's certainly not clear to me that only humans have episodic future thought. I do think though we have it on a scale that no other species has. In other words, we, we seem to be able to do it at a level of depth and detail, both and, and both functions that other species, you know, we don't have any evidence that they, they can rival. And so what do we mean first off by episodic future thought? So if people don't know what episodic future thought is, is that it's the idea that we are able to imagine in detail Right, what um, you know, if, what our both what our our future could be, counterfactuals like what could have happened in a situation. What you know, we, we can imagine even things that could never happen. Right, we can we, we have this we have a very wide ability to do that, and there's good evidence that we rely on our memory system actually for that purpose. We have, in fact, the same memory the same memory system that allows us to remember episodes from our past can be leveraged to to generate because that's a generative system. We actually can generate episodes in our future. But our ability to do all that, to do all that planning, everything else, and this is, I guess, the point I try to make in the, in the book, is, is, is it, it, that itself depends on cognitive control. Because the kinds of planning and, and thought, if you really want to do detailed episodic future thought or thinking, um, often what you're doing is relying on your, you're structuring that through control systems. And also you're generating plans that are at a level of sophistication and detail that, that are, have, can be hard to implement. Right. So if you if you have if you generate you know, a great plan that has multiple contingencies or it's very deep in the future, right, you have to keep regenerating that plan unless you have a control system that can implement it. Right. That's able to structure that that plan accordingly. And so um, to some degree, these two things put a constraint on one another. Right. In other words, having um, having a very strong control system allows us to to engage in episodic future thought more readily. And the more we do that, then then that. that creates a um, advantage for having a, a deeper and more flexible control system and so on. Yeah, just just fascinating. Um, all right, well, I have one more question on your book, really general question, and then um, we're nearing our time or getting close to it. So I uh, got some final questions after that. Um, sure. But just as kind of to, to bring it all together, what would you say is like, uh, you, we talked about the the idea, the thesis of your book earlier on. What would you say is the, the most important lesson about cognitive control or the most important lesson from your book? Um, yeah, I think probably the thing that, that I, again, I would take away, we kind of, I mentioned it when you asked me about the thesis, is this, this disconnect between knowledge and action, right? That, um, you know, we have that it's not enough that we know and we know something or even the right way to do something, right? In order to um, understand why people do what they do. We have to understand both sides of that story. We have to, we have to understand you know, how, we get, how we gain understanding of the world. How do we know things about what we want to do and generate our plans and, our, and so forth. We also have to understand the constraints we're under in terms of being able to implement them and make them real in our lives right? and structure our behavior. And this, this is something that um, emerges in all kinds of ways in our everyday lives, right? From, you know, the frustrations we might have about not getting what we want, you know, procrastinating or not getting something done that we want to that we want to com we want to complete um, at the really proximate level to, you know, broader issues we might have with addiction or with, um, uh, you know, other issues that that you know are people we know who have issues with 
um, with behavioral problems, right? That can be a problem. And it also even boils scales up. And I even touched on this at, in the last chapter too, at the level of the society, right? This is, these, these there are, I, I hit a number of kind of trade-offs in the book, right? There's trade-offs between, and by trade-offs, I mean, these are fundamental computational trade-offs where you favor one thing, it's going be at the cost of something else. We already gave an example of one of those, right? Was the example of, um, of speed versus specificity, right? That in the stopping system, right? You wanna be able to, you can either stop specific things slowly or you can stop everything quickly, right? That's sort of the a trade-off you deal with. But there are a number of other these trade-offs like flexibility and stability or accuracy and, um, and generalizability and so forth. And um, you know, any system that wants to be flexible and compositional in what it does is gonna have this be subject to the same constraints. And so societies also do. And I give an example at the end of like how human society is dealing with crises like climate change, for example. Um, and I bring it up only because this is interesting case where um, like a, a large majority of people now um, I mean, there are definitely people who still don't believe that we're we're facing a, a crisis in climate change, or who are or who or, or who think that like it's not a big deal, and that and that's that's still a part a piece of it. There's still a knowledge piece of this, but there's actually a, a you know recent polls suggest majority of people do think this is a, a problem. But if you look at the at the kinds of things people are doing in their everyday lives, there's a big mismatch, right? That that people who are interested in this area see, and to me that looks a lot like the same kind of knowledge action dissociation, just at the level of a society, right? That it's not sufficient to be aware of things. You have to. It's hard to take one pattern of activity and change it to a new pattern of activity. It's the same kind of control problem, and so um, you know we can learn a lot by understanding not just about ourselves but also about any system like that by understanding a problem like cognitive control. Yeah. That's that's really cool. And uh, the uh, the the last two questions I have are not about your book, um, but what if you had to give somebody one book about the brain or the mind, and that was the only book they could read about the brain or the mind, not a textbook, uh, what would it be? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a good question. What would I pick? It's funny. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say because of my discipline, I, I don't read as many like general neuroscience books as I as I should. I probably I read mostly technical papers or like technical books in my area, or I read like general purpose books in other fields. <laughs> yeah. right, but let's see. I mean, if I I think if if I were there, there's some great books on individual topics. Like I think, for instance, um, uh, I think you know if you're interested in memory. Um, I think the, the Dan Schachter's Seven Sins of Memory is still a, a terrific book. It's an older one now, but I, a lot, it's like, there's been so many things in psychology and, and neuroscience that have kind of recently been subject to this replication crisis, right? Where they aren't, don't replicate and sort of these old things we thought we knew aren't there. But that book actually is, I think a lot of it is, is it's, it's still, it's held, it stayed up to, this, to the test of time. So I think that's a, that's a great uh, a, a great example of, of a book like that that I think would be a, a good introduction to the to this field. Um, yeah, that's the that's that's my answer to your question. Great, great. I haven't read that one. Uh, Daniel Schachter, Seven Sins of Memory. Seven Sins cool. of Memory. Yeah. Okay, I'll give that a sh I'll give that a shot. Um, cool. And my last question, I, I apologize for the generality and uh, take it however you want, but um, I'm just really interested in asking an expert like yourself how would you answer the kind of elevator pitch version of how does the human brain work? Hmm. If someone asked me that question, I don't know, that's a good question. I think I would have to say that the, the, it's, a, it's a huge network, right? So what it, it's doing is it's, and it's a network that exists within the world around it. Right. So it, it is not just in your head, right? That it takes inputs from the world and then it's going to communicate within itself in this, in this great network, but then it takes actions that affect that world. And that and those and in fact, in fact, affect the world in such a way sometimes to affect the inputs to that very network. And so um, the understanding the brain means understanding it's it's not just how. It, it, it interacts within itself, but how it interacts as an embedded system within the world around it. That's perfect. That's a, that a good elevator pitch version. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you so much for answering all these questions and 
just being here, providing this information. I, I really appreciate your time. Um, maybe you can uh, give people uh, places to find you or, or um, where to, to look for you on social media or whatnot. Sure, yeah, and, and thank you, by the way, for the invitation. I'm always, always happy to talk about this topic. And that's actually why I wrote this book is that I, I always felt like, it, speaking of elevator pitches, like I was, I was always jealous of the other, of other scientists who study things like vision and memory. It's like people know what the heck they're talking about. When I say I study cognitive control, no one ever knew. So, <laughs> so you know, I had to give it. I had to come up with elevator pitches, and it was never easy. So, um, you can always come. To, so I appreciate the chance to talk. Um, you know, you can you can always go to my lab website, which is at, at um, if you just look up Better Lab, uh, it'll it'll bring you there um, at, at, and for more information. Or um, if you're interested in this topic at all, if anything today interests you, I do I do recommend the book. That's why I wrote it. Really was to for people to learn about this topic that's not as widely recognized or as known as other topics in, in neuroscience. Yeah, and and nobody be fooled. I mean, we we went into some detail here, but there's there's a lot more in this book. And I, I highly recommend it to anybody interested in the brain, in uh, neuroscience, psychology, especially in cognitive control. So um, thank you again, David. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. All right. Well, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, would you mind giving it a like? And if you're on, or if that is if you're on YouTube or a five-star rating, if you're on a podcast platform, also be sure to subscribe so you never miss anything new from Sense of Mind. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation, and this episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.